Hello and welcome to Nikolai's Genetics Lessons and today we are going to discuss micro and macro evolution and phylogenetic trees, how to build them and understand. And this is going to be a second part. In the first part I was talking about micro evolution and I am going to put a link to that first part in the video description below. I highly recommend to watch that first part as well. What are the forces that drive evolution? One of them is natural selection. Take a look, here we have a plant, Crepsis sancta, which produces seeds of two types. One type of the seed has a fluffy uh, part of the seed, which helps it to be dispersed over the wind to the greater distances. And the other variant of the seed doesn't have this fluffy part and it would fall near the mother plant. So now let's ask ourselves a question. Will second variant of the seed would give any advantage to this plant in a forest? Obviously not. But in a city limits where we have a lot of asphalt, such plant usually grow where there is a bare soil. So it makes sense to produce more seeds of the second type instead of first type. In the cities, second type of the seed would produce for a plant better fitness. After collecting experimental data, scientists have found that in urban area, when dispersed seeds of C. sancta were likely to have a 55% lower chance of landing in a habitat suitable for growth than non-dispersing seeds and were more likely to land on some part of the concrete matrix. And here's the results of the experiments. Due to higher cost of seed dispersal, there was a rapid evolution favoring non-dispersal seeds over dispersed seeds, occurring over a range of 5-12 generations of selection. What this means? It means that evolution may happen very rapidly and may take 5-12 years because this is annual plant. And we say that this is example of the microevolution and macroevolution we are going to discuss in the following slides. So what is a microevolution? Microevolution is a pattern of evolution on the grand scale, what we see when we look at the overarching history of life. For example, extinction of dinosaurs or origin of mammals or radiation of flowering plants. Now you see that example from the previous slides was example of microevolution and when we talk about macroevolution we talking about grand scale now you know that whenever we see phylogenetic trees tree of life we are talking about macroevolution so macroevolutionary patterns are generally what we see when we look at the history of life and the study of the microevolutionary patterns is carried out in phylogenetics here is one more slide which would help you to understand the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. So microevolutionary events are building blocks of macroevolutionary patterns. What are driving forces behind microevolution? Mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, natural selection. This is basically what happens to any species every day. All these uh, forces drive microevolution. But if we consider all these driving forces, accumulation of them over the millions and billions of years, we are going to get macroevolution. Here is a couple more definitions. What is a phylogenetic tree? It is a diagram showing the evolutionary interrelations of a group of organisms derived from a common ancestor. By studying inherited species characteristics and other evidence, we can reconstruct evolutionary relationships and represent them in a family tree called phylogenetic tree or phylogeny. Understanding a phylogeny is a lot like reading a family tree. The root of the tree represent ancestral lineage and the tips of the branches represent descendants of that ancestor. As you move from the root to the tips, you are moving forward in time. When a speciation event occurs, a single ancestral lineage gives rise to two or more daughter lineages. So, as you see, here we have ancestral lineage and here is a speciation event. And now we have a split to two daughter lineages, but they have same ancestor here. 
phylogenies trace patterns of shared ancestor between lineages. Each lineage has a part of its history that is unique to its alone and part that are shared with other lineages. So his unique history of C, unique history of B, and for example, this part would be shared both by B and C, and this part would be shared by A, B, and C species. Similarly, each lineage has ancestors that are unique to that lineage and ancestors that are shared with other lineages, common ancestors. As you see, ancestors represented by blue box, unique for lineage C. But ancestors represented by green box, shared by both lineage B and C. And ancestors represented here with yellow box would be common for lineage A, B and C. And in this slide you see how about 150 years ago uh, Charles Darwin did a sketch of the phylogenic tree. Basically we can find both of these variants in our modern textbooks. Sometimes we can find something like this, artistic work, and sometimes we can find something like this, which we call unrooted tree. In a previous slide you saw handwritten sketch of the Charles Darwin of the phylogenic tree and here is a picture from his book Origin of Species. We see here three lineages. All these species are modern species, meaning they are existent and all what you see here just didn't make it. So these are dead ends of the evolution. All the species are extinct. Now let's define a clade. A clade is a group consisting of a species and all its descendants. Which of these colored groups are clades or monophyletic? This picture contains a mistake. Take a look. For example, if we say that clade is a common ancestor, for example, here and all its descendants. So we circle this species, we make this box and this is monophyletic group and this is clade. Here we also have common ancestor here and it includes all its descendants. Now let's consider this green box. We have here common ancestor, but in order to be monophyletic group, it also have include clade A because this is definition of the clade, a group consisting of species and all its descendants. As you see, green box doesn't represent monophyletic group. As you see on the slide, if we consider this common ancestor, then a clade would be all these descendants. So group A and B species have to be in the same clade. So in this case, we will call them monophyletic group. But if we only consider this green box, we can say that this is going to be paraphyletic group. So what is the definition of the paraphyletic group? It's going to be a group which exclude some of the descendants of the common ancestor. For example, let's take this monophyletic group. But if I would circle this group like this, so I exclude one of the descendants, of this common ancestor, this is going to be what is circled paraphyletic group. But what we see in a box would be monophyletic group. Here's a couple more examples. Now you would be able easily to define paraphyletic and monophyletic because we here excluded one group. So this is going to be paraphyletic. Here is common ancestor and we just excluded one of its descendants. And here we have common ancestor here and we circled all the animals, all its descendants. So this is going to be example of the monophyletic group. Now you should be able easily to define monophyletic group, which is here, common ancestor, and, and we include all the descendants. Paraphyletic, common ancestor, and we exclude some of the lineages. And here also we have polyphyletic group when we join groups and do not include the common ancestor. So we say that this is polyphyletic group. If you study evolution, I guarantee you that this 
question would be on your exam. You should be able to recognize paraphyletic, monophyletic and polyphyletic groups in phylogenic tree. And this is all for today. Subscribe and see you in the next video. Goodbye.